Well, good morning, everybody in Asia. Good evening to everybody in the United States and uh, everywhere, everyone else around the world. Thank you very much for joining this Heinrich Foundation webinar. My name is Andy Staples. I'm the Director of Research and Outreach for the Foundation based here in Singapore. Today, I'm delighted to welcome all of you and, of course, our distinguished speakers to examine one of the most pressing geopolitical issues facing Asia, namely the relationship between the United States and China. More specifically, over the next 60 minutes or so, we'll be looking at the implications of the rivalry between these two powers for Southeast Asian nations. This, of course, is the central topic uh, of concern of, David, uh, of Professor David Shambaugh's new book, Where Great Powers Meet, America and China in Southeast Asia. Professor Shambaugh is the Gaston Sigur Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science and International Affairs, and the Director of the China Policy Program in the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University in Washington, DC. He's an internationally recognized authority and award-winning author on contemporary China and the international relations of uh, Asia. Professor Shambaugh, thank you very much for joining us. Okay. I'm also delighted to welcome to this session uh, Professor Wang Gunwu, who has kindly agreed to act as discussant and share his thoughts on the issues explored in Professor Shambaugh's book. Very briefly, uh, Professor Wang is a university professor at the National University of Singapore and is best known for his explorations of Chinese history and for his writings on the Chinese diaspora. He was chairman of the managing board of the Lee Kan Yew School of Public Policy and the director and chairman of the East Asian Institute here in Singapore. Professor Wang was a distinguished professorial fellow at ICS, Yusof Ishak Institute, where he was the chairman of the board of trustees. And he was also professor emeritus of the Australian National University, University, uh, National University and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities. Professor Wang, thank you also for joining us today. Just before we get underway, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Please do your, send in your questions at any point from uh, here on in. We do have a large audience today, so could I urge you to keep your questions short and succinct? That way we'll be able to get to uh, as many of them as possible. Also, please be aware that we are recording uh, this session and we'll post the recording on our website um, in, in the coming days. With that, um, I'd like to get us underway. And to, to do that, I'm going to invite, or I'm going to set Professor Shambaugh the impossible task of, of giving us a, a, an overview of the key themes and issues within his, uh, his new text. Um, and perhaps, Professor Shambaugh, I could ask you, uh, I could start us off by asking you, why this book and why now? <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, uh, Andrew, thank you, first of all, very much for the uh, introduction and, and uh, to the Heinrich uh, Foundation uh, for organizing today's uh, webinar. And greetings to all of you out there in Asia from here in Washington, DC, where you can see it's uh, dark and nighttime outside. If, if it were, were not dark, you could see snow outside. I know you don't get a lot of snow in Singapore, but we had a few inches. It's been snowing for the last three days here in Washington. Um, but um, let me, before I answer your, your question, uh, Andy, um, let me um, also thank the Heinrich Foundation, not just for organizing today's session, but indeed for a grant that uh, the foundation awarded me uh, to help facilitate the research uh, that led to this book. So um, Heinrich Foundation uh, is not only contributing at the uh, tail end as the book has now come out, but very much at the front end as well. I wouldn't have been able to travel around Southeast Asia and undertake the field work um, if it weren't for that grant and, and a couple of others and a sabbatical. Um, uh, second thing I'd just like to start off by saying quickly, it's a real pleasure, and I mean this in great sincerity and indeed honor to share today's, uh, share today's session with Professor Wang Gongwu, um, who is my much admired and esteemed colleague and friend of, of long standing. Um, Gongwu is I think one of the few, the people I admire have most in my life. And indeed, I have dedicated this book to him. Um, it's dedicated with great admiration for Professor Wang Gungwu, exceptional scholar, gentleman, colleague, friend, and inspiration. Indeed, you are an inspiration to all of us, Gungwu, and it's a real pleasure to share this uh, session with you today. Um, 
I would like to, uh, while we're promoting books, hold up Gung Wu's most recent book. Those of you who would like another good book to read, uh, this is entitled, it's his memoir, his and Margaret, uh, his recently passed wife, um, memoir called Home is Where We Are. I cannot recommend it highly enough. So Gung Wu, I wanted to plug your book too. <laughs> it's really, it's a wonderful read. Um, okay, so Andy, just uh, briefly answer your question. It's a good way to get into how this book of mine came about. Um, it was rather circumstantial, I have to say. I won't elaborate this too much, but I had a sabbatical from George Washington University back in 2017. One of the great things about sabbaticals, or about being an academic, are sabbaticals every seven years. And if you use them right, you can build new intellectual capital and um, expand your horizons, you know, and, and that's what I decided to do. I had this wonderful uh, invitation from the Roger Ottman School at Nanyang Technological University, and I can't say enough good things about RSIS. Fabulous institution, wonderful hosts, great people, excellent students. I taught a couple courses while I was there. Um, so I uh, went there in 2017 for about eight months and then returned uh, the following year uh, to ISIS at, um, on the campus of NUS uh, to finish up the field work in Malaysia and Indonesia and, uh, and there in Singapore. So it was, a, it was a circumstantial opportunity. I thought, well, as long as I'm going to be in Southeast Asia, I can't just live here and teach classes. I need to have a research project. So I, I knew nothing about Southeast Asia. I have to say, this is uh, really terra incognita to me. Um, it was then, it still is. I've learned a great deal in the last three years. I've truly broadened my horizons and Southeast Asia is gonna be part of my intellectual and professional life uh, uh, for the remainder of it. Um, so I didn't have enough knowledge about Southeast Asia to write a book about Southeast Asia. So I thought, right, let's use the prism of US-China relations uh, to look at how the 10 member states of ASEAN are navigating um, their relations with, with Beijing and Washington respectively. It was a puzzle. I love puzzles. You know, all my book projects, I have to say, I have no idea where I'm gonna wind up when I start out. Um, and this was a puzzle too. So let me, uh, in, in brief time that I have, do uh, maybe three things. First, give you a couple of kind of contextual framing comments about uh, the book. Uh, secondly, give you the main takeaways and conclusions of the book. And thirdly, peer into the future a little bit and where I see this uh, relationship and the competition between the US and China and Southeast Asia going. So um, contextual comments first. Uh, first, this is not just a book about China and Southeast Asia. It's very much a book about the United States as well. Um, there are a number of new books just recently published on China and Southeast Asia, which I would commend to um, everybody. Uh, Merle um, Hebert here in Washington, uh, Sebastian Strangio out there and, uh, in Southeast Asia, my colleague Mike Lampton here and his colleagues, Chung Chi Kuik and, and um, Selena Ho um, have all come out with new books and, and Don Emerson at Stanford. So there's a sort of mini tsunami of China, Southeast Asia books. Uh, mine is too, but it's also very much about the United States. So um, second uh, sort of contextual comment, I guess, is it's not just a study of contemporary affairs. It is that too, you know, people are interested in buying a copy and understanding where this competition is at present. Yes, you're very much going to get that, but um, you're going to get a good dose of history um, in it as well. As once I started digging into the subject matter, I quickly realized, like everything you pull, you peel, you know, peel a, a you know, an orange or something, you just keep pulling it back. You couldn't understand the uh, current situation, much less recent decades, if you didn't go back in time. So there are um, two full chapters on the pre 20th century, and then there's uh, parts of a couple other chapters on the um, on the 20th century. So there's uh, just to warn people, there's um, some history there. Now, in the case of the United States, it goes back to the first American consul in uh, what was then known as the Dutch East Indies uh, in 1802, discusses the arrival of, of the first American missionaries in 1813 in, um, in Burma and Siam, uh, then the arrival or the 
the arrival of the American Navy, <laughs> the so-called Asiatic Squadron, first sailed into Southeast Asian waters in 1835, um, and the first treaty uh, the United States signed with the Kingdom of Siam in 1833, um, which is still the bedrock treaty for the U.S.-Thai relationship. Um, and what the U.S. and Thailand date their uh, formal diplomatic relations to. So, and then it goes on through the rest of the 19th century um, and into the 20th, including the colonization of the Philippines by the United States in the wake of the Spanish-American War, um, and the expansion, the commercial expansion, I should say, of the U.S. in the region in the first half of the 20th century. Then there's discussion about the Second World War, uh, and and then it moves through the entire Cold War period. So. Uh, as you know, historians, <laughs> you know, Professor Wong and other historians would probably cringe that I tried to you know compress um, so much history into one chapter. Um, you know, the whole books, volumes, multiple volumes have been written on that. But I thought it was important to give that context for the U.S. The U.S. that's obviously rather recent compared to China. Now, in China's relations in the region, <laughs> like everything else, uh, go back much further. They date to the Qin Dynasty. 221 to 206 BC, right? When the first recorded records of interactions between the Han and what were then called the Yi people, basically people who live south of the Yangtze River, but down into uh, continental uh, Southeast Asia into what later became known as Indochina. There were so many Yi people, the Chinese called them Bai Yi, the hundred years. Um, so, and Professor Wang himself has been a, trailblazer in uh, exploring the historical records of <clears throat> that interaction between China um, and not only continental Southeast Asia, but more importantly, maritime uh, Southeast Asia. There's a lengthy discussion in um, one chapter uh, about the Nanhai trade and uh, Nanyang trade, which Professor Wong um, was, uh, I think, well, he was a trailblazer early in his career writing about it. I think it might've been your first book, Gung Wu, or one of your first articles in the Royal Asiatic Society's journal or something. But anyway, and I hope I did justice to the discussion of the non-high trade in, in that chapter. I, as I was writing it, of course, we were emailing. I checked with you to make sure that what I was saying was, was historically accurate. Um, so there's discussion of that and the so-called tribute system. There's discussion of the China-Vietnam uh, relation animosity. Um, there's discussion of Southeast Asia's role uh, in overthrowing the Qing dynasty, right? So Sun Yat-sen and many of the exiled uh, intellectuals and revolutionaries uh, that prevailed in the 1911 revolution plotted the revolution, you might say, from Singapore and Penang just up the coast. Um, so that's, so Southeast Asia played an important part in ending the imperial uh, Qing dynasty. Um, and then it goes through, uh, you know, the second half of the 20th century. So anyway, the point is that um, I try and, and give readers uh, that sort of background context because you cannot just parachute in uh, today uh, in, into the subject matter. You need a sense of, of that background. Um, and then the, the other quick contextual uh, statement is that I proceed in the book, and I do intellectually more generally, from the premise that the United States and China are now locked into indefinite comprehensive competition across all functional domains, political systems, diplomacy, commerce, security, military, espionage, ideology, values, technology, education, research, public diplomacy, soft power, media, domestic governance, global governance, you name the area, and the United States and China are not on the same page. At least that's the way it looks from Washington. Um, so I, I, that's the kind of independent variable. That, it's that uh, competition that it frames and informs the book. So I, and Southeast Asia is just one region of the world. This competition is not just across functional domains, it's literally across the entire planet, every region of the world. It's in space, it's in cyberspace, it's in the Arctic, it's in the Antarctic. The, you know, this is great power rivalry is back, folks. Um, now, the Chinese may not like it, uh, 
uh, Yang Jia Chur just gave a speech a couple nights ago uh, to the National Committee of US-China Relations, denouncing great power rivalry and what they call the Cold War mentality. Uh, so the Chinese don't seem to, uh, you know, agree that there is this competition, but from the American standpoint, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and so Southeast Asia is interesting. It's really interesting. It's kind of microcosm of this competition. A number of those elements that I just mentioned, most of those elements are all present uh, in the Southeast Asian uh, context. And it's a more than microcosm, it might be a harbinger really for how the US-China competition is gonna play out in other regions of the world. Um, like it or not, and the Southeast Asians don't really like it because they have a long history of, of hedging and then very, uh, you know, they pride themselves very much in a post-colonial identity of neutralism and independence. Uh, they have an accomplished record of really keeping external powers at bay, but, I think it's going to be difficult for them this time around. These two big powers are just circling the region and are deeply embedded in the region. So that's what the book really does. It tries to unpack um, both countries, like what I call the toolbox or toolkit of um, each uh, country's roles in the region. So I look at, uh, you know, certainly the commercial space, the security space, the um, uh, espionage space, united front work, um, soft power. Uh, I try to look at diplomacy, of course. Uh, try to look at, at uh, those different domains in each country's uh, role in the region. Okay, so that's background. What are the big takeaways of the project? Well, um, first one, it may seem obvious, and certainly to those of you in Asia, um, but um, Southeast Asia is, has to be taken on its own merits, not as some sort of laboratory you know, or petri dish for big power competition, um, which uh, here in the United States, I dare say there is a tendency to do. Southeast Asia, and I don't have to tell our audience um, the importance of the region, um, so I'm not gonna do that, but it is of enormous geostrategic, geoeconomic, it's the sixth largest, collect, you know, if you add the 10, uh, member states economies together, sixth largest economy in the world. Lots of things that define the region uh, that give it really great importance. Um, secondly, um, uh, the competition I see between the US and China, I describe as, as a soft rivalry, as distinct from a hard rivalry. Okay, so what, what does he mean by that? Well, if you think back to Cold War 1.0, and we may be in Cold War 2.0. We can discuss that if you're interested. Uh, but in Cold War 1.0, the United States and Soviet Union had a very action-reaction, dyadic, uh, tit-for-tat kind of relationship. You know, if Moscow did A, Washington would do B to counter it, then Moscow would do C to counter Washington's actions, and, and so on. It was a very interactive, um, global, uh, uh, competition and rivalry. I don't see that yet in the US-China um, relationship and competition today in Southeast Asia. Um, it's a the reason I call it a soft rivalry because it's, I use the metaphor, it's like shadow boxing, right? They're, they're dancing around the ring at each other, not landing direct blows and not um, premising their policies, each side, on what the other is doing. That's my point, I guess. Both sides are pursuing their own independent uh, policies and actions with a, you know, looking over their shoulder, you might say, at the other, watching very carefully. Believe me, the Chinese are watching the Americans very carefully. The Americans are now increasingly, and I think under the Biden administration, you will see a much greater focus on China's activities in the region than you saw under the Trump administration. Um, so this is not a action reaction, zero sum kind of, rivalry. It's what I call competitive coexistence. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, it, you know, it means that uh, the two sides are, are not firing shots at each other yet. There are possibilities of that in the South China Sea. And we can talk about that if you're interested. Um, but the relationship is not like it was during the Cold War yet. It could get that way. And when I get to my scenarios for the future in a second, that's one of them. It could become more um, 
sort of uh, polarized. Um, and the region may be forced to choose. Right now, the region is not being forced to choose. And we hear all the time, particularly from Prime Minister Li Xianlong, don't ask us to choose. You may not like the answer. <laughs> and indeed, um, uh, we can come back to that. But that's Southeast Asia's sweet spot, you know, is in the middle being trying to get the benefits of relations with both parties and maintain their autonomy um, in the in, the con in that context, and that brings me to the, the next takeaway. This is not just a dyadic um, story. It's, there are multiple actors in this story, not just Beijing, Washington, and the 10 member states of ASEAN and ASEAN itself, but other so-called middle powers, Japan, South Korea. In fact, I was in uh, the audience in Singapore uh, two years ago when um, Prime Minister, or President Moon came down and launched his southward policy. Um, Australia, certainly, India, and the European Union, all, and member states of the European Union, particularly the UK, all very active. And that is, makes for a very complicated chessboard analytically. Um, but it's a good thing from ASEAN's perspective, and I would argue it's a very good thing from the American perspective, because all those countries are allies and close partners and democracies, um, close partners and allies of the United States. So they give the United States, I would argue, a kind of multiplier effect in the region. Okay, let me just, uh, last conclusion uh, is kind of counterintuitive conclusion. I didn't, I didn't know it before I started this project, but I, it's what I call China is an overestimated power and the United States is an underappreciated power in the region. So what do I mean by that briefly? Um, uh, with an eye on the clock. So I'll try and get, get finish this quickly. So if you travel around the region, one is just overwhelmed daily by the pervasive narrative that China is already the dominant power in the region. This is a natural state of affairs. China's rapidly sucking all regional states into its sphere of influence. Um, and everybody needs to kind of get on the bandwagon. Um, that's what I encountered everywhere I went. In fact, I remember the very day I arrived in Singapore, the Straits Times, big long article, time to leave Uncle Sam and embrace Beijing, I think was the title. And then for the next three years, that's all I read. That's all I heard. If you travel across all these countries, it's just China, 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 China. Well, I think that's overestimated. I don't think it's empirically correct. And the book is filled with examples of the unevenness of China's footprint. Yes, strong in certain areas, commercial, obviously, weak in several other areas. I would even argue uh, diplomacy, soft power, their security assistance programs or lack thereof, South China Sea, obviously, United Front operations um, and relations with the Chinese diaspora in certain countries. And even the BRI. So, you know, don't get me wrong. I think most Southeast Asian countries uh, welcome the BRI, but we know that there have been a number of problems with BRI projects in a number of countries and there's been pushback. And I uh, wonder in the book whether uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries are gonna have what I call Myanmar moments or Malaysia moments, such as Myanmar did in 2011 with the Mitsoni Dam and pivot away from China at that time. And of course, what Malaysia did under Dr. Mahathir in freezing the BRI projects and renegotiating their terms a couple of years ago. I think that's a harbinger. And if you go to Indonesia and you go to these other countries and you interview people about BRI, you get a lot of complaints, whether it's Chinese labor, you know, there are 30,000 Chinese laborers in Indonesia alone associated with these projects, environmental concerns, human rights concerns, and so on. Okay, so that's one takeaway about China. I think it's overestimated. Um, and this narrative is not empirically correct, although narratives and, have, and perceptions have a way of becoming realities. And then on the United States, um, and I say this not just because I'm an American, but I think the United States gets next to no coverage in regional media. There is very little appreciation and understanding in Southeast Asia of the American footprint there. And I argue that it's uneven too, just like China, that we have strengths and we have weaknesses. Um, I argue in the book that the US has many more strengths than people are aware of. Commercial strengths, 
yeah, we don't have the $600 billion in trade that China does, but $350 billion is not small change. Investment, uh, this is my favorite statistic. <laughs> American total stock of American investment in Southeast Asia is greater than China, Japan, and South Korea combined, $329 billion. China is $138 billion, even on an annual basis. The last figures we have, 2018, American foreign investment, 24.9 billion, China, 12.9 billion. So twice as much American investment into the region than from China. Boy, that surprises people out there, I would suspect. Um, so the American commercial footprint, 4,200 companies operating across the region, very active chambers of commerce, very strong soft uh, power, I would argue, despite all the, the uh, damage done in the last four years during the Trump administration. There's a lot of repair work to be done in the American um, image around the world, and that includes Southeast Asia. But I would say there's a reservoir of intrinsic respect for um, American education, American uh, popular culture and sports and, and so on. So, and then security assistance. No, China, nobody else comes anywhere near the United States and what it provides us, uh, seven of the 10 ASEAN countries in terms of security assistance. We can go into that if you want. So those are two kind of counterintuitive things I found in my research. Um, so then lastly, just to peer into the future, I posit in the last chapter four alternative scenarios. First would be a continued bandwagoning with China. And I do find in the book that the region is gravitating towards China. It's not just, a, it's not a false meme. I wasn't saying that, there, is, there are empirics behind it. Uh, there has been movement towards China in the last few years. That could continue, so that's, that's one possibility. The second possibility um, is that uh, China overreaches, oversteps, steps on others, you might say, toes, and begins to alienate uh, different countries in the region. Uh, and there's pushback, as I see already taking place in a number of countries um, over not just BRI, but other things as well. So that's a possibility. Third possibility is, as I say, a possible polarization of the region where the two countries are much more, uh, you know, Cold War-like in premising their, their policies and their behavior on the other, countering the other side. And then the last possibility is that ASEAN um, uh, tries to pull back really from Beijing towards the more neutral point. I have a spectrum uh, in the last chapter and right now, seven of the 10 countries are on the Chinese side of the neutral line. Uh, only three, Vietnam, Singapore, and the Philippines, I would argue, are on the kind of American side. So the last scenario is that ASEAN exercises its agency and um, uh, doesn't bandwagon with America. Those days are over, um, but moves more uh, equidistant between the two powers. So why don't I stop there? I'm sorry, Andrew, I've uh, exceeded my 20 minutes. Um, no, um, uh, Professor Shambhal, thank you very much indeed for that uh, uh, comprehensive overview. And it strikes me that we we need a series of webinars to dig into each one of those topics that you've uh, that you've raised there. It's very difficult for us to do justice to all of them. But um, let, let let's try uh, to to dig into some of the key uh, issues that you you've raised there. And at this point, I'd I'd like to come to Professor Wang. Um, uh, David was was talking a lot about the the importance of historical context. Um, we, we've realized that we're not at the end of history, that him, uh, history uh, continues. And um, I wonder from, from, from your perspective, looking back uh, over the years of um, the, the, the different engagement that South, Southeast Asian countries have had with China and with the United States and where we are today, what your thoughts and reflections are um, on, on the current trajectory for relations between those two, uh, for ASEAN uh, or Southeast Asian nations, I should say, and uh, the United States and China. But let me pass it over to you, Professor Wang. Well, now, let, let me begin by saying that uh, David has embarked on a, a something that is quite different from many of the books that he mentioned about uh, Southeast Asia and relations with the great powers. And that in his case, he has not only gone back to give the historical background to the relationship, and they, they, there are a lot of variations there, but he has actually managed to do that by picking or the key aspects of US relations with Southeast Asia over time, 
and the Chinese one over a longer period of time, and then focus it on the fact that these two are now in competition, and that in that context of competition, where does Southeast Asia stand? And that focusing, I think, is special to that book. Uh, and he comes with a very fresh uh, approach because, as he himself says, he had concentrated more on U US and China in the past and not given enough attention to Southeast Asia. But he's come now with that US-China background and focuses on where does Southeast Asia stand with vis-a-vis -vis these two great powers in competition in that particular context. And I think that makes this book very special. And I do hope that people will read that and bear in mind that this is one of the first books of its kind that focuses so sharply in that way. The questions raised by David, of course, are enormous. They're very difficult ones. And they, as, you, as you rightly point out, they cover a lot of areas, which each, each one of which can take a, a, a webinar a web discussion <laughs> a long, long way. But let me just focus on a couple of things which I, I thought particularly interesting. Uh, he, when he concluded that, um, that the Southeast Asian states having their own perspective on each of those two powers and their own understanding of the relationship over time have reached a position which he describes as ambivalent. They are ambivalent. Now that concept itself is interesting to me because in the past, the countries outside of the Cold War and outside of any major great power competition has always been to be to try to be neutral. And I, I remember as, as belonging to the generation when the word was neutrality was a tossed around by various countries who didn't want to join either side in a, in a, in a Cold War. This concept of uh, just being ambivalent is itself an indication that this is something different from the Cold War. It isn't quite straightforward. He calls it hard and soft. One may say it may be softer than harder and harder than softer as in the past. But the point is that kind of ambivalence is very hard to pin down. And the fact that David has very studiously gone around to every country and talked to the key peoples to try and find out exactly how they felt and then make the contrast between what was publicly said in public doc documents and what they would privately say to David and bring this out is actually very interesting uh, insights, uh, added insights to our understanding of the relationship. So this brings out ambivalence. It's not a pub neutrality as a kind of public stance. You make a sort of bold stance, I'm neutral. I don't belong to either side. But ambivalence is more insight, a psychological response to something too complex. Neither side, nobody is quite sure how really they should be responding. So ambivalence is a kind of more movable, shifting thing so that even the, the, the chart that David offers about who's leaning on which side and so on, you must see that as a dynamic thing. I would say that it is not stationary. He's got it down as three to seven, roughly. But basically, I would say this shifts depending on the monsoon or the wind or something, or getting up on the right side of bed in the morning. But I, so this is very tricky. So this, this ambivalence thing, I would like to chase up with David to explain this a little bit further. I personally offer an explanation. And that is unlike the Cold War, when everything was defined in ideological terms, and ideological terms have a kind of almost fanaticism and almost religious faith behind it. Today, I think what we're observing is actually two kinds of capitalism. And there's a rivalry between one kind of capitalism that offers freedom, liberty, and private enterprise, and put, puts the emphasis on initiatives by a different uh, uh, different creative minds as well. And the other side being the, always seeking state control. The state must never lose sight of what that capitalism is leading the country to. And that insecurity about capitalism being let loose and then going, taking the state into areas that they don't want to go. So the state must always be staying close to the capitalists and making sure that the capitalists play the game according to the, the state's uh, wishes. And th that really that kind of competition between capitalisms is probably the source of this ambivalence. Now, I'm putting it out there for David to, to examine it further because I think it will help to clear our minds too as to what is the exact nature of this and what kind of world can, uh, can we see in the future between these two kinds of rivalries. 
I'll leave that to David to, to help us with that. Thank you. Uh, uh, P P Professor Shambo, that's a, a fascinating take that Professor Wang just, just shared there. And, and, and you mentioned the sort of differences between the, the, uh, the, the Cold War era, uh, the very clear ideological differences between the United States and, uh, and China for, uh, and um, Russia uh, at that point. But now we are in a, in a very different um, time. And, and the challenge, I guess, is, is how do you deal with the, the Chinese state as it is that's utilizing capitalism uh, to uh, uh, to further its own uh, own aims, but, and, and how do we get through that ambivalence? And um, uh, just to remind you, uh, Professor Chambo, you're on mute at the moment. So um, thank you, Gungwu, first of all, for for bringing uh, up the the point about ambivalence. I meant to say that actually in in my opening comments. But wherever I went around the region, every conversation I had, this just appeared in the in the conversation. The sense of ambivalence and anxiety. I would say too is another adjective I would use. And you're quite right to say it's a kind of a, it's a psychological, almost emotional, affective um, dimension of uh, people's feelings about uh, China or the United States. Um, and it's at variance with that meme or that narrative, that hegemonic predominant narrative that I encountered about China, 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 China. You know, so if you actually talk to people about China, um, whether there are scholars or officials or others, NGO, civil society people, um, there's ambivalence, you know, it just comes back very quickly. There, I ran into very few people who were really comfortable with China and um, what China's doing. They, they, there's a sense of, um, uh, you know, sort of fait accompli almost there's a sense that you know China is just here. It's so big we can't ignore it. We have to we have to get on the bandwagon to some extent, but we're not really happy about it. You know, so that's the ambivalence I kept establishing. You know, um, whether you're talking about China's commercial footprint or the South China Sea, or its um, diplomatic positions or the United Front operations, you know. There's a lot of the ambivalence applies to China. It also applies to the U.S. And of course, in the U.S., there's a the ambivalence arises out of a, a feeling of neglect. You might say the Southeast Asians that I came across um, really would like the United States to be much more present and um, and particularly diplomatically, um, but. America's got a lot of baggage, you know, in the region and in the world. And obviously here at home in the United States, we've got all kinds of repair work and healing to do. Um, so I found the same kind of ambivalence in conversations about the United States. So that, you know, that's really kind of, Gung Wu, you hit on exactly the major theme in the book. It's not just a, a cataloging of toolboxes, you know, what's in Beijing's toolbox and what's in Washington's toolbox. Um, I really wanted to give um, appropriate attention to ASEAN's own uh, approaches and its own agency and its own sort of feelings and psychology, you might say, towards the two powers. So the book is actually organized, the first few chapters, what I call outside looking in from Beijing and Washington's perspectives. And then the last very long chapter uh, is inside looking out from ASEAN's perspective. And I go through all 10 countries and how each of those countries looks at both powers. And the conclusion is ambivalence. <laughs> so, you know, that has implications for uh, policy. We can get into that if you're interested in the Q&A now that we have a new administration here in the United States. But I'm, I'm Appreciate your picking up on that point. I'll have to ponder the capitalism question uh, some more, Gung Wu. I don't have a quick reaction to it. Um, I would say though, that if you look at the commercial footprints of China and the US in the region, they're very different. Um, China is building things and America is facilitating things. If you look at the American companies that are on the American chamber lists in all these countries, you will find consulting services, um, legal services. I mean, to be sure, companies like Boeing, you know, sell aircraft and defense, the defense industries, American defense industries do big business. But um, generally speaking, it's financial services, uh, tech. US needs to do more in the e-commerce space. Um, but it's different than building 
ports and rails, higher speed rail and other hard infrastructure. Um, so it's an apples and oranges question. The commercial space, the Chinese do one thing, the Americans do other things. Um, and Southeast Asia can benefit from both. So, but I'll ponder that. Thank you, Gong Wu. And if I may follow up a little bit on that is that your, your question of ASEAN agency is also very important because it's one thing for each country to face, with, to face itself with two great powers and having to make some decision or other about each of them. But when you can act together as 10, hmm. on one hand, it protects each country uh, in one way or the other. Uh, and uh, at the same time, given the ASEAN loose structure, unlike the European Union, in the loose structure and sometimes very chaotic structure, you have that uh, some freedom to insist on your national interest. So what is so interesting about this new phenomenon of a region that respects the national interests of the countries within the region, and yet at the same time on key issues, when they see is the region's interest to gang up together and, and stay firm and speak with one voice, they, are, they manage to do that. Now that itself is a new phenomenon. And I'm, I'm not sure that either United States or China have faced this problem before. A region that is itself united. In fact, if you look around, there is no such region elsewhere. So this particular feature of ASEAN has been able for 50 years now, and particularly the last 20 years when it's 10 full countries, are able to submerge or at least to converge their national interest into a regional interest and somehow express it to show agency in a major competitive situation like that. That is quite remarkable. I'd like you to comment on, is that, is that possible? Can that continue? I would hope so. Um, and from an American standpoint, uh, a successful US policy though in, towards the region will be tailored I would call it towards each of the member states. It will have, there's no one size fits all kind of policy. And unfortunately back here in, in Washington, the US, you know, Southeast Asia is halfway around the globe and there's a tendency to talk about Southeast Asia. Well, the first thing one learns when you get to Southeast, if you get around Southeast Asia is everything is characterized by diversity, capital D in every domain. And there is, you know, ASEAN, yes, it has its, um, successes and it's got its shortcomings, but it is, uh, you know, it doesn't act with the kind of purpose um, that you just mentioned um, with regularity. It does, you know, seem to rise to uh, crises, although I would say it has failed miserably on the South China Sea issue, it has not risen at all to meet that challenge. But the point is that the, the diversity across the member states really requires kind of in-depth understanding of the agency of each state, right? And the, and the domestic politics and ethnic composition, all kinds of issues. So a successful policy, I think, has to really get down in the weeds and not just start with Jakarta, with the with ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta. That's not the place. You may wind up there, but you should start, I would argue, uh, in all the 10 member states. And then you have to deal with ASEAN as, as an institution too. But um, it's not the kind of institution that uh, the US uh, would like it to be, and it's never going to be. It wasn't intended to be that way. And it's not an EU type of institution either. But it is, um, it's what the region wants and it does uh, help, I think, facilitate uh, its interests on many issues. Maybe if I could um, uh, jump back into the conversation, we do have quite a few questions coming through and um, I, I, apologies in advance to everybody if I can't get to your question individually, it might be that I bring a few of those questions together. And in fact, uh, an, an example of that, there are a few questions here about the um, uh, Chinese diaspora within Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, the question around whether that diaspora also shares this ambivalence towards China. China, of course, we know has been courting uh, overseas Chinese groups uh, quite um, uh, attentively in, in the last few years. But Professor Wang, um, how do you see uh, this, uh, the Chinese diaspora in, in Southeast Asia fitting into the uh, agency that you were talking about there for individual nations? Well, China has also been changing its policies about how to deal with the Chinese overseas. As you know, uh, when they first came in, they actually encouraged 
the, uh, the, the Chinese to make a choice then. If they have chose China, they would, should go back to China. If they stayed on in those countries, they should be loyal citizens of those countries and hopefully be friendly towards China. That's the kind of a rhetoric of the time. And what has happened is that over the last 50, 60 years, most of the Chinese have settled in these countries, have made their commitments to those new nation states and, and trying in their, each in their own way to be loyal citizens, to be able to help their country in, to develop economically and so particularly in the areas of their own expertise. And throughout Southeast Asia, I would say that most of the settled diaspora Chinese populations have actually identified with the interests of those countries. And the, the Chinese today, the China today, is not quite sure how to deal with that because they're also dealing with new migrants, people who have come from China in the last 20 years. Now they are very different. They are educated, born, brought up in China, understand the Chinese situation, and have family and close relations back in China, they are more emotionally involved in what China is doing and very easily approach to, under, to help China understand the Southeast Asian city, the country they're in, and at the same time offer their own understanding and expertise about what they know about the countries they, they made their homes in today as new migrants. Now these migrants of course have a special relationship with China. And I think the Chinese appeal to them is much easier to understand because they, can, they hope that they will at least understand what China is up to. Whereas I think most of them, most of the Chinese policymakers in China realize that the majority of the settled populations who are identified with the nation states of Southeast Asia don't really understand China either. And whatever they may feel about China, they don't know what is happening in China and they could actually mess things up if they, if they to, to get themselves involved in, in all of this. So I think they themselves are aware of it but how to approach, how to make a statement about those of Chinese descent mm. and, and make a distinction between all these groups, I think it's too, it's too difficult for them. They can't quite do that. So when it comes out, it sounds as if it's, they're appealing to all people of Chinese ethnicity to, to, to turn to China, which I think they are su sufficiently realistic to know that that's not gonna happen. Mm. So I think that is real. But what they are still hoping are those new migrants, much more important to them are those new migrants. And, and there, of course, Southeast Asia is not the most important. They are addressing really, the, most of these United Front's uh, documents that I've lo looked at, they have really addressed those millions who've gone to United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe, who are university graduates, very well educated, highly con connected with high places in China, who could actually help directly help China one way or the other, because they can be expected to understand China, and if they understand the Western countries or countries outside, they have a much more sophisticated understanding of those governments there and therefore can help China, at least if, if not to bridge the gaps between the two, at least to help ensure that all the businesses and connections and so on move, get, get, around, get done very smoothly. So that is, I think, the main focus. But the language they use, uh, they, they, can, they do not know how to separate this from those they know. I mean, frankly, I think, the Chinese government would be horrified if all those diasporic Chinese of several generations in Southeast Asia who are national citizens of this country want to go back to China. What to do with them? You know, I think that'd be, that's, not what they, that's not what they want at all. And that's yeah. my understanding. Thank you. David, it's an interesting point because all of those, um, uh, not just uh, people of, of Chinese descent, but of course from uh, right the way across Southeast Asia, particularly thinking about Vietnam, uh, uh, Thailand and, and so on uh, in the United States that's a, a, a source of um, but, but perhaps engagement and power for, for the United States to be looking at as well but I, I need to, to move the, um, the conversation on a little bit more because time is, uh, is moving on um, and, and, and let's focus on uh, the, the, the Biden administration uh, and I've been struck um, uh, reading through your book thinking about the history of engagement with the United States uh, in the region but of course you yourself just mentioned the damage uh, that's been done over the past four years the, the ambiguity the, the mixed messages that we've had uh, uh, from the Trump administration. Um, so it, uh, let me just pose you a, a simple question uh, for the Biden administration. What do they need to do? Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, they need to, first of all, pay uh, attention and constant attention, not episodic attention. <clears throat> um, they need to staff uh, out the administration, both here in Washington, which, which will come, um, but particularly in the region. Uh, with ambassadors, you know, we have been 
uh, in the last four years under the Trump administration, several uh, Southeast Asian countries, including Singapore, we haven't even had an American ambassador there. So um, we need people, we need good people, experienced people, not you know donors and ex-politicians. We need people that understand the region, speak preferably some of the languages of the region. I'm very encouraged, I must say, with the initial appointments uh, of the Biden administration on the Asia front, beginning with Kurt Campbell, um, who is known to many, everybody, I think, probably on this call. Kurt um, crafted the Obama administration's Asia policy and Southeast Asia policy. And in the book, I give um, the Obama administration very high marks. That was the exception to the tr traditional pattern of benign neglect. The Obama administration over eight years did all kinds of things uh, that I trace in the book to elevate America's presence and contributions uh, to the region. Now, the region thinks that there wasn't much, wasn't sufficient follow through, that the pivot didn't deliver as promised. And, you know, I'm willing to admit that uh, to some extent, but um, Kurt, you know, has uh, great experience with the region. He's very well connected. He's, he's staffing out the National Security Council Asia Directorate with some very experienced people. You will see in the next uh, week or two, uh, similarly uh, experienced people being appointed in the Pentagon and at State Department, and indeed other departments as well, Commerce, uh, USTR, um, so they're going to be experienced people and they're going to be people whom Southeast Asians already know. So that's the first important thing. Secondly, um, is to craft, as I say, a variegated policy depending on the 10 member states, not a one size fits all um, approach. And I think the Biden people, Kurt in particular, but others, um, Sung Kim, by the way, is just being brought back from Jakarta, where he's been our ambassador for the last few years. Prior to that, he was our ambassador in Manila. Prior to that, he was our ambassador in Seoul. He's now being brought back as the acting assistant secretary of state for East Asia Pacific. Um, so um, the point is, it's not just ASEAN. You're going to see a, a very, uh, you know, tailored, I think, country by country approach. Third thing, um, I would note that is really necessary is for America to up its public diplomacy game. The competition with China is being waged in multiple domains, but I think one of the mo most decisive domains is the information domain, the competition of narratives and, and to uh, counter Chinese propaganda, to be quite blunt about it. Um, and the kind of narratives that are so pervasive in Southeast Asia about China. I, fr I frankly think Southeast Asian media falls much too readily into the Chinese propaganda trap and becomes, and indeed Chinese me state media and Chinese private corporations are funding a lot of Southeast Asian media and are thereby um, affecting, if not controlling, the messages and the narratives that reach Southeast Asians in a kind of pro-China way. So the United States has got to get out there and tell its own story about the United States better. Uh, we, and that includes all the warts, all the problems. We have lots of problems to fix. Um, but but, but and, if, if, I could, if I could jump in on, on that, I think a, a very concrete example of that, of a US commitment would be, for example, membership of, of the big regional trade agreements that the CPTPP, uh, RCEP, right. Uh, China's already in RCEP, of course, and, and has expressed interest in joining uh, TPP, although that seems to be a, 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 a bit of a stretch. But do you see any likelihood of, uh, of the Biden administration doubling down on, you mentioned the foreign direct investment presence here as well. The, the, the other side of that would, would, of course, be trade. I think they're going to take a close look at uh, joining uh, CTPPP, I can never get the new acronym straight. Um, I'm not going to predict they're going to, but I know they're going to take a close look at it. RCEP, um, similarly. But I have to say, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of suspicion in the United States about free trade agreements. Um, and I know the Heinrich Foundation is a great advocate of, of trade and free trade. But if you listen to even what uh, Jake Sullivan, the new national security advisor has said, you know, the hollowing out of, of American industry as a result of globalization and the, the pain that American workers and citizens have felt prior to COVID um, as, re, as a result of globalization is real. And many Americans associate these multilateral 
trade agreements uh, with that process. Whether that's accurate or not, I'm not going to pass judgment. But there is a, you know, that's Hillary Clinton. If you go back four years, she did not endorse TPP as a presidential candidate. And of course, Trump pulled out of it. Um, now, we can have our preferences. I, I would support joining it myself. But I'm just trying to tell you and tell our audience in Asia how average Americans uh, look at these kinds of uh, organizations. Thank you. If, Professor Wang, if I could come to you on that point, and I'm cognizant of, uh, of we're rapidly running out of time, but um, this is a very important point, isn't it, that, that um, the United States changes its strategic direction with its, uh, uh, with its presence, and that's been particularly stark uh, over the past four, four years, whereas China is a constant, uh, particularly under Xi Jinping. We know where China is going. It's a, it's a known entity. So how do governments stakeholders in, in Southeast Asia deal with that challenge of, of um, ambiguity, I suppose, on the behalf of, of US engagement? One of the ways that they recognize is absolutely necessary for them in, in as smaller countries in the region is in fact to act as a region. This is new to Southeast Asia. Don't forget, this is something that Southeast Asians have never thought of before. They've never thought of themselves as a region. And they've only beginning to learn in the last 30, 40 years in particular, that being a region and acting as a region gives them a much better sense of security. And if they try individually to, to deal with any of these issues, they, they, they'll get into even deeper waters. So I think that recognition is a start of this ASEAN agency that, that David writes about. And I think this is important to bear in mind because in a way the, the Chinese have come to recognize it because they've been dealing with it from the very beginning, from the beginning of ASEAN plus three, when they brought in Japan, Korea, and China, they've been practicing, as it were, a kind of region dealing with another region. In fact, as you well know, China, Japan, and Korea could never organize a region. They're not a region. They've never been able to talk to each other properly. But through ASEAN plus three, they were able to do so. It's quite interesting. So this is, again, something I brought up earlier, to recognize that this idea of a regional presence and that the regional agency is different in quality from national agency. And that this regional agency can be of use not only to the region itself, but to the people outside the region who could use the ASEAN as a region as a means of expanding their own set of networks and so on. For example, Australia and New Zealand joining all this enables them to reach out to countries which they put that directly would have much greater difficulty. And I think, for example, at the moment, we're all expecting and hoping that India would join much more actively, but they've been a bit hesitant for their own reasons. Understandable, but for United States not to be actively, in a way, utilizing this set of relationships that the region of Southeast Asia that ASEAN has become, that, that has actually opened up a lot of avenues, and not to actually make use of it for at least Americans' interests, as the Chinese have done, and I think they've done it successfully, and they deserve some of the good relations that they have managed to preserve despite people's hesitations and suspicions and, and anxieties, that they, despite that, they've been able to make progress through the fact that they join. And ASEAN has always been open and inclusive, welcoming countries to join. And for you not to join, it seemed to me uh, not, 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 a, not a good idea. So this is a way of actually expanding and extending your, your networking system. And, and uh, as we move towards the final minute, I think, David, a, a, a very good point for the United States and uh, your quick comment that uh, ASEAN is open, it's welcoming, the United States should, um, uh, uh, should be more involved. Well, I think the US is gonna be more involved and it's going to, one way it's going to be involved is to listen. Um, I know Kurt in particular, um, uh, really wants to listen carefully to what all Southeast Asian countries uh, have to say about um, the relationship with the US, about Beijing, about ASEAN's own future, about their relations with each other, some of the friction points. So the US is, I think, the uh, Biden administration um, doesn't have a uh, kind of set, set of policies that are going to be instituted and implemented. I don't think our Southeast Asian friends need to worry about that. In fact, it's going to be very reactive and will evolve out of um, really requests and preferences offered by Southeast Asia. I think you're going to find a, um, and, and that's the way it should be, I think. Uh, the successful power 
uh, should be reactive and responsive and sensitive to Southeast Asian concerns. And if I could just say, that's not, not something that China specializes in. China doesn't listen very well, and it has zero threshold for criticism, in fact, negative zero. Um, and that's a big problem for a major power. If you're going to be a major power, you get criticized. You know, we Americans, we, we know that. Um, you got to, the question is, what do you do with the criticism? Do you listen to it? Do you listen to it constructively? Do you kind of try and think about it and really understand what the other side is saying? And then do you maybe alter your policies as a result? So, you know, the U.S., uh, I think, doesn't always do that. But I think you're going to see in the Biden administration um, a more sens sensitive, reactive uh, kind of approach to that region, as well as other regions of the world across the Atlantic and elsewhere. <clears throat> China, as a scholar of Chinese foreign policy, I would say that is the major challenge to Chinese foreign policy. It needs to learn to listen um, and, you know, and engage uh, rather than steamroll others. Well, we are um, just over time, actually. And um, again, uh, a fascinating uh, opportunity to, to hear from, from both of you uh, on, this, um, uh, on this topic and uh, related themes. As I mentioned at the outset, we do need a whole series of these. Uh, so maybe I'll be badgering you to see if we can get some more of your time uh, in the coming weeks and months. And there's plenty on the agenda. We have this issue that's erupted with Myanmar, uh, which is being discussed in the UN at the moment, and uh, how is ASEAN, China, uh, uh, and the United States and others uh, are going to handle that. We have, of course, the ever-present uh, issue of the South China Sea. Uh, we have issues around trade, around technology. Um, so um, I, I, for all parties, I think a, a great opportunity uh, for them to um, consider their, their, their position by engaging with your uh, book, uh, Professor Shambo, and, uh, and thinking about what those uh, different scenarios might be uh, as we move forward. Um, both of, uh, to all of our audience today, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed uh, this session. Uh, I certainly did. And as I mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll try to come back and look at some of these issues as we move through uh, 2021. Um, uh, Professor Shambo in uh, Washington, thank you so much for joining us on a snowy and dark uh, February night. Uh, and Professor Wang uh, here in, in Singapore, again, thank you for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to have you uh, on board. Um, finally, I'll just draw your attention to uh, David's book, which is, um, of course, available through all major retailers. I think um, uh, this is the first uh, opportunity we've had to, to discuss it at length uh, with, uh, here in, in Asia. Uh, I'd urge you to go and have a look at that. And finally, just a quick plug uh, for the Heinrich Foundation. If you haven't already signed up to our newsletter, please do so, so we can keep you abreast of all of our research and events looking at issues related to trade, uh, geopolitics, foreign direct investment, and of course, sustainable um, uh, trade uh, within the region and beyond. So with that, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and I wish you all a very good day. Thank you.